their colleagues, friends of the university and friends of the globe, I could say here today, I guess. Uh, it is indeed a great pleasure to be here. It's also a great pleasure to be allowed to open and to welcome you to this 11th RNS Symposium. I'm not a very religious man, so I'm not sure I'm going to bless anything here today, but I'm indeed very happy that we have this topic here today, and I'm really looking forward to the day. A special warm welcome to, to uh, Mary Evelyn Tucker uh, from Yale University and this year's RNS professor. Uh, really looking forward to your lecture. And I guess what's the topic today, the core of the RNS Symposium is to inspire and discuss solution to the environmental crisis in the spirit of the Socratic quest that imbues this philosophy. The RNS uh, professors represent leading international scholars working on the questions of global justice and the environment. And here, during these two days, they are invited to engage with the Norwegian academic environment, the NGOs, and with the public sphere. And we are indeed proud that through Zoom and this wonderful organization, we are able to preserve and critically develop the intellectual legacy of RNS. And we are happy that we have a broad, beautiful audience here today as well. The Homo Futurus, which is the topic of this year's RNS uh, Symposium, captures the essence of the Norwegian leading nature philosopher. In many respects, Ness was a Homo Norvegicus Futurus, a scholar who very early, already in the 1950s, pointed to the future environmental and climate crisis and demanded that the defendants of nature should rise. And Arnes was ahead of his time, thinking about the problematic relation between humans and nature and in the ways he translated his philosophy into action. So in the two-day symposium, the Norwegian, uh, the, 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 so the Norwegian and international scholars, students, artists, architects, IT specialists, are asked to imagine the future and tell us how to make it better and more sustainable. To some extent, the symposium also links to the 2018 Nobel Prize in Economy. One of the laureates, William Noda, is also from Yale, began working on environmental issues in the early 1970s as a part of the effort to determine the economic cost of global warming. At a news conference recently after receiving the prize, he considered what he called the last frontier of climate change. I think we understand the science, he said. I think we understand the economics of abatement. We understand pretty much the damages, but we don't understand how to bring countries together. That is where the real frontier work is going on today, was his message. This, the relation between humans and nature. So indeed, I look forward to the symposium and hope you will find it both interesting and possibly provoking, which I think is suitable at the RNS Symposium. So I really look forward to the day and thank you so much. Now, Albert Einstein said that science without religion is lame and religion without silence, science, not silence, but science, religion without science is blind. Uh, and it seems to me that much of the work of our uh, 2018 RNS professor, uh, Mary Evelyn Tucker, is very much about the interplay between science and religion, uh, between evolutionary story of humanity and the wisdom that is inherent in world religions. And uh, Mary is based at the Yale University, as you've heard, uh, where she and her husband, John Grimm, uh, direct the Forum on Religion and Ecology. She's co-organized countless conferences on world religions and ecology at Harvard University. She's also one of the founding fathers of founding mothers uh, of um, uh, uh, the International Earth Charter. Now, that said, I think there's one dazzling book and film that should be mentioned in this context, namely The Journey of the Universe. This is a, uh, a, the Emmy awarded film. You should watch it. It will change your lives. And I hope that today's lecture will introduce you 
all of you to some of the aspects of this journey into the universe, which and where will, I, will it lead us? I don't know, but uh, something that is going to be an inspiration to us all. Mary, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. What a pleasure to be here. What an honor to be part of the Arnie Ness Symposium. I was able to meet with my husband, Arnie Ness, in 1990 at a conference on the universe story. Um, Norwegians have been an inspiration to us, and he is certainly a key one. But I also must say, Tor Heyerdahl, we met on a Baltic symposium. And he too, with his concern for nature, his concern for peace, uh, was a great inspiration. And as well, just a couple years ago, Gru Brundtland came to Yale to speak, and what an honor to meet her. So your country, men and women, have had international effect, and we thank you, and for the ongoing work that is happening here. So, living within a universe story, what does this mean? What could it mean for all of us? We know that a story has a sense of orienting and grounding us, especially to the cosmos, awakening our imagination in relation to nature, giving us a sense of our place, our role in situ. Um, it provides worldviews and ethics, and this is for millennia. Now we have creation stories, clearly, that do this around the world. Our Genesis story in the West, a key example. But all the world's religions have such creation stories that have given them guidance and ethics. Now, clearly with Charles Darwin in 1859, we had a major contestation with these creation stories. Um, and we're still recovering in ways, so we're still trying to understand the implications of this. Now, just 50 years ago, this most famous photograph appeared from a space expedition, Earth Rise. I can remember it, I think many of you can. A life-transforming moment where we saw that blue-green planet shining in space. Even the astronauts were unprepared for the power of this perspective, a cosmic perspective. Ten years after that, it was suggested that we need then a new story, one that integrates science and humanities, bringing in the evolution of universe and Earth with awe and wonder, a functional cosmology that activates human energy for ecological and social change. The author of this, Thomas Berry, was the key person to put this forward. His I'm just giving two of his books, one, The Sense of the Dream of the Earth, that had this new story in it in 1988. He also had this notion of a great work. What does this mean practically, on the ground, functionally? Um, several of his quotes are quite famous now. He said, we have ethics for homicide and suicide, but not for biocide or geocide. We have the sense of Earth as a communion of subjects, not a collection of objects. And finally, he was calling us to mutually enhancing human-Earth relations. Now, this putting together, then, of cosmology, ecology, and ethics in a new story is a move, as we understand it, from anthropocentrism to an anthropocosmic worldview, embodying our ecological self, as Arne Ness would say, and our cosmological self. The first iteration for this, in some ways, was the universe story in 1992 of Brian Swim and Thomas Berry, and that's when Arne came for the conference. Uh, almost 20 years later, Brian Swim, who is himself a cosmologist, a scientist, and I did this book. It took us 10 years to do the book and the film and so on, working closely with scientists. Um, the book has been translated into European and Asian languages. As uh, was mentioned, it, it won an award. Um, we've had journey showings on public television in the U.S. and internationally uh, around the world. I want to also mention, though, the conversations um, are a key part of this project, where I interview 10 scientists and humanists to deepen the evolutionary story. These are great for use in class or in community uh, settings. But as well, 10 environmentalists who say, what is this great work on the ground for economics, for cities, race, energy, food, education, arts, indigenous worldviews? Well, how does this matter? Um, so, we also have these massive open online classes. 
uh, that 22,000 people are participating in now. Uh, they're free, and I'm not trying to be promotional here, but I am trying to just say this worldview is becoming, in some ways, around the world, uh, which is what we hope to do even more. Now, let me move to say, how does this relate to other things that are happening in our society? Uh, we all know the Anthropocene, the sense that we're in a new uh, period, 10,000, 12,000 years, the Holocene is ending uh, because of human-induced planetary change. Um, ecological and social challenges are clearly with us, climate change, eco-justice, pollution, toxicities, food security, increased inequity, extreme wealth, consumerism, and I would say the end of a dream of progress, and this is why we need a new story. Now, Thomas Berry took this even to a larger level, and he said, we are actually ending the Cenozoic period, which is 65 million years since the dinosaurs went extinct. Um, and he would say, as many scientists are saying, we are in a six extinction period. This is on the floor at the Natural History Museum in the US. It's, while some of the particulars are contested, it's not contested that we're in an extinction period. Um, at the same time, Berry would say, we are awakening to a new intimacy with universe and earth uh, for the flourishing of life. And he called this an ecozoic era. Uh, he would say the sense of evolutionary context gives us deep time in which to put our, not only our thinking, but our action. There's awareness of evolution and its beauty. There's awareness of extinction, destruction, and loss. This is what we're living uh, between. So evolution, then, is some kind of a new story um, of life emerging from chaos and creativity, self-organizing processes at every scale, galactic, planetary, ecosystems, life forms, complex systems of emergence, of which Humboldt had uh, prescient understandings. Now, if we take from the beginning this great flaring forth, uh, as we like to call it, to the emergence of gal galactic systems, to our solar system, and how long this 14 billion year process took, to our own Earth system, which is after 10 billion years of universe emergence. Uh, this is a 4.6 billion year planetary process, of which the first cell took almost a billion years to emerge. Um, from that, we're understanding volcanic systems, the aliveness of the Earth. Again, as, as Humboldt understood, these magnificent and diverse ecosystems with the emergence of plants some 470 million years ago, uh, the non-human animals that we share this planet with of all kinds of species here in Norway and elsewhere. And in this midst, we humans have emerged rather late and yet part of this process, understanding somehow our relation to this beauty and complexity. Now, this interconnectedness then of ecosystems is what is impinging on our consciousness in extraordinary ways, not always fully aware of how complex these systems are, but evolution and ecology is giving us this sense of a community of life of interdependence, of relationality, of reciprocal resonance, of the flourishing of life. Now, we are still clearly between stories, one of individualism, one of holism, between nationalism and internationalism, between economism and well-being, between militarism and nonviolence, racism, sexism, classism, and inclusivity, hyper-individualism and an earth community, reductionism and holism. So, what is this based on? In part, the sense we have enlightenment values for individualism. They still have an appeal around the world, clearly. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. But the suggestion here is that we need interdependent values for holism. That life includes life of all species. Liberty requires responsibility to the Earth community. Happiness with a sense of belonging and the quality of life is more than the quantity of material goods. I would say the Nordic systems understand this <laughs> quite well. 
Um, but with the broadened values, our manifesting is what I want to suggest uh, going forward. We have it in science, even science museums, I'll speak about in a moment. UN processes such as the Earth Charter, civil society and NGOs with resist and protection of these species and systems, in religion and ecology with the Pope's encyclical, Laudato Si, and in this uh, Journey of the Universe project. Let me begin with an example of the American Museum of Natural History, but this is true for other museums around the world. So, in 2000, this new planetarium uh, was built. It's quite spectacular. Some of you have probably been there. But what's amazing is this cosmic pathway to human history. So you walk down this pathway 100 million years with every step. And at the bottom, you come to one human hair under glass. And it says, this is all of human history. It's a perspective that we're coming into of deep time. And what does life, human life, and the life of other species mean then? The whole of Earth there is dealing with plate tectonics, which took almost 40 years for scientists to accept even that idea. So part of this living Earth sensibility um, is very much clear in these exhibits. Now, the other thing that happened at the Natural History Museum during this building process was they were looking for ornithologists, a new curator of birds, and they had six finalists. And of the six, four of them had their birds go extinct while they were studying them. Now, this was a wake-up call for the museum, saying, what are we doing? Are we just watching at the edge of extinction? So they created this quite remarkable hall of biodiversity, talking about both loss and restoration. It's a amazing place, especially when you see children pressing uh, up against the glass, looking at these species. So, ecology and cosmology coming together. It's Arnie Ness's idea of this ecological self and a cosmological self. So we've just seen it in science with cosmos, earth, humans, and biodiversity coming together. So I want to give you some other examples from the UN, the sustainability, NGOs, religion, and as I've mentioned, the journey of the universe. Gru Brundtland, our common future, really began this sustainability movement between environment and economics, 1987. Um, and it was a great inspiration for the future of all species. And so the Earth Summit had the Convention on Biodiversity, the first time we could say we must speak for all species, all Earth systems. So the real Earth Summit was a beginning of a movement from something like a declaration of independence, as we would say in the US, to a declaration of interdependence. And Maurice Strong and uh, Gorbachev said we need an ethics for sustainability and sustainable development. So what happened was, in a period of almost 10 years, uh, was this Earth Charter, where the preamble emphasizes cosmology, that humanity is part of a vast, evolving universe. Earth, our home, is alive with a unique community of life. Now, in 97, when we were in Rio and Gorbachev held that up, Native peoples were so moved to tears that their worldview of the aliveness of nature was in a document like this. The three key parts are ecological integrity, social and economic justice, democracy, nonviolence, and peace. You need institutions to ensure ecology and justice. Um, and I can assure you that was an incredibly vetted civil society document. Women, business groups, academia, and so on weighed in. Now, we also have many, many grassroots movements that are speaking up for interdependence of life. Uh, the People's Climate March at that time was the largest. There have been many, of course, around the world. But 400,000 people coming together in New York uh, was very remarkable. And people at the UN were saying, the people's movements matter. Um, this past year, as you may know, the movement of Standing Rock in North Dakota, where my husband is from, was one of the most moving the largest gathering of indigenous peoples in North America up to that time. Um, and the sensibility of protecting water, that water is life, came across in ways that are just remarkable. And some of the films are just beginning to come out from that. So in addition, religions are moving to say, 
they too have been part of a sense there's a religious ecology weaving humans into ecological systems and there's religious cosmologies. How do we relate to the stars, the galaxies, and so on? And that's what we were trying to do in this project at Harvard. Clearly, one of the most remarkable documents for this sense of interdependence of people and the planet has come forward in the Pope's encyclical. And we can all have skepticism about <laughs> religion and churches and so on. Fortunately, he's quite an authentic uh, person and, and someone with credibility on this issue. Our colleague at Yale said in the summer when this came out, he said, oh, I don't know, Mary Evelyn doesn't have cap and trade in it. But he came back after the Paris conference and we had a seminar at Yale and he held up the encyclical and he said, I feel this is why we got an agreement in Paris, because there was a moral force there um, that hadn't been present in the same way. So the point is that we're broadening our role as humans, that we are citizens of the universe, is what the Natural History Museum actually says after you go through those, that staircase, that we're members of an Earth community, is the Earth Charter's language, and that kinship embraces humans and nature and species, and that's in the encyclical. So this awareness then of our relatedness to cosmos and Earth is coming from our common evolutionary heritage. The stars are our ancestors. It's not just a metaphor. We know we've come from the explosion of stars, that all life, carbon-based life, has come from that. So there's a shared genetic language. Our closest kin are what Jane Goodall understood with the chimps, the great apes, and so on. What an extraordinary sense of relationality with our closest cousins. This fraternity with all life that indigenous peoples have understood, your own Sami people, um, that implies we need care for the flourishing of people and the planet. So we are moving towards, against great odds, which we're all aware of, of acting with a sense of belonging to something larger, that a broadened ethics is forming with both cosmological and ecological ethics, there's actually a book called Cosmological Ethics, <laughs> um, that the response to life's beauty and complexity requires responsibility for its continuity, and that new forms of education, economics, business, politics, and ecology are emerging. So if we come back then to this vision of our galaxies, our cosmos, uh, to Earth with all of its beauty, uh, as seen from space, and to future generations, which a symposium like this is fundamentally about. We have then a sense from Arnaness of this ecological self, where he says, the everything hangs together maxim of ecology applies to the self and the relation of other living beings, ecosystems, the ecosphere, and the Earth with its long history. How prescient he was. And I'm going to end with one of our greatest scientists of the 20th century, and that is Albert Einstein. A human being is part of a whole, called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He, she, <laughs> experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. The delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from the prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Let's thank Albert Einstein for that insight. <laughs> Now, I think that, that Mary Evelyn Tucker has successfully challenged the despondent prediction of uh, Woody Allen, not to mention Alan S., who proclaimed himself to be a doomsday optimist. There is lots of uplifting uh, information about the movement and ferment going on in the world in the direction that might actually save us all. But let's listen to more uh, of the um, uh, reflections on the future and on what it is to be a homo futurus. We are very privileged to, ha to have here with us today the award-winning uh, historian and writer, Andrea Wolf, who has written a masterful study of Alexander von 
Humboldt, who, as we know, was a Prussian uh, explorer, uh, a polymath, and a naturalist. And I think very much like Humboldt, uh, Mary, uh, uh, Andrea Wolf is also a polymath, voracious polymath, explorer and naturalist. And uh, she's going to talk to us today about, um, well, about the present, the past and the future, and the present of the past in the future. Uh, <laughs> uh, Andrea, where are you? Here. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much. It's a great honor to be here, and it's a great honor to speak after Mary Evelyn Tucker. Um, I'm going um, I'm going to start with something um, who's with a quote not by Humboldt, but by George Perkins Marsh, um, who was one of America's first environmentalists and who said in 1861, the future is more uncertain than the past. Now, this year's um, Ananes Symposium is about the future, but as a historian, I'm a great believer that we should look into the past to make sense of the present, and then maybe we can dare looking to the future. So I'm going to talk about Alexander von Humboldt, who was a man who very much shaped our thinking about nature, but who also had to say something about the future. And Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, said the following about Humboldt in um, 1869. He said, Humboldt was one of those wonders of the world, like Aristotle, like Julius Caesar, who appear from time to time as if to show us the possibilities of the human mind. So one of those wonders of the world. However, when I've been telling people over the past few years that I'm writing a book about Alexander von Humboldt, the most common reaction I got actually is a blank face, because very few people, um, at least in the English-speaking world, have heard of his name, which is a little bit bizarre, because his name really lingers everywhere. There are more places, plants, and animals named after Alexander von Humboldt than anyone else. Uh, there's, for example, the Humboldt Current, which is the cold ocean current that hugs the west coast of South America. There's the Humboldt Penguin. There's the California Humboldt Lily. There is a five-foot, quite fierce um, Humboldt squid, which swims in the Humboldt Current. There is a, a recently discovered flying squirrel, so this is North America's newest um, mammal, and uh, also brand new uh, Peruvian um, frog from the Andes. Even the largest container ship is called the Alexander von Humboldt, so, uh, which I think is quite appropriate. Um, there are, in Latin America, there are dozens of monuments and parks named after him. There are mountain ranges in China, in um, New Zealand, in South Africa named after him. In North America alone, there are 13 towns, four counties named after him. There's a lake, there's a bay, there's a mountain, there's a river. Even the state of Nevada was almost called Humboldt when the name was discussed in the 1860s. And I would have loved to say Las Vegas Humboldt, but <laughs> that didn't quite happen. So who was this man? Um, so let's start with a few facts. Uh, he was born in 1769, the same year as Napoleon. He was so famous that his contemporaries said that he was the most famous man after Napoleon. He was the son of a wealthy Prussian aristocratic family, um, but he left his life of privilege and he went on a long five-year exploration of South America. And it was a voyage that changed his life, his thinking, and that made him famous across the world. He was called the Shakespeare of the sciences. He was a visionary thinker who influenced not just scientists, but also politicians, revolutionaries, poets, artists, writers. Thomas Jefferson, for example, called him one of the greatest ornaments of the age. Napoleon was jealous of him. Charles Darwin said he would have never boarded the Beagle without Humboldt. Henry David Thoreau, one of America's greatest nature writers, uh, his book Walden would have been a very, very different book without Humboldt. Simon Bolivar, the man who liberated the Spanish colonies in South America, called him the discoverer of the new world. Goethe, Germany's greatest poet, said spending a few hours with Humboldt was like having lived several years. Even Captain Nemo and Jules Verne's famous 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea owned all of Humboldt's books. He was, as one contemporary said, the greatest man since the deluge. And I hope you're going to believe me after this short lecture that he really was. He died in 1859, 
just a few months before his 90th birthday, and 10 years later, in September 1869, the centennial of his birth was celebrated across the world. And when I say across the world, I really mean across the world. There were parties everywhere. There were parties in Moscow, in Melbourne, in Mexico City, in Buenos Aires, in Egypt. 80,000 people marched through the streets of Berlin. 25,000 people walked through the streets of Manhattan to, un to walk all the way to Central Park where they placed a bust of Humboldt, uh, which is still today um, opposite the Natural History Museum, if you want to pay a pilgrimage to him. So he was really famous across the world, yet today he's almost forgotten. So the question is, why should we care? Why should we care about a man who's been dead for a long time and who's been forgotten? Well, I clearly think we should care a lot because I think that he shaped us and that his ideas are still incredibly relevant. Uh, one of the most important ideas he comes up with is that he comes up with this idea that nature is an interconnected whole, a web of life. He describes Earth as a living organism, where everything was connected from the smallest insect to the tallest trees. He united the arts and the sciences because he said that we needed to use our imagination to understand nature. He was an inventor. He came up with isotherms, for example, which are these wavy lines which we can still see on today's weather maps. He was the first to define global climate and vegetation zones at a time when other scientists were looking through the very narrow lens of classification. He was a pioneering map maker and really I think the founder of what we call today infographics. Um, he used complex scientific data in a very visual way and I'm just going to show you one example. Uh, so this is a map of plant distribution, and when you look at the detail, you can see how he's using color coding and icons to show global vegetation zones. He's the forgotten father of environmentalism because he warned of the devastating effects caused by monoculture, irrigation, and deforestation. And amazingly, he predicted harmful human-induced climate change in 1800. So he's a pretty amazing human being and very prophetic. Um, so for me, the invention of nature was really my attempt to find Humboldt, but also to help to restore him to his rightful place in the pantheon of nature and science, where I think he belongs just as Isaac Newton or Charles Darwin. Now, the great thing about writing a book about an explorer is that you have to travel the world, all in the name of research. Um, so for me, this was very much a journey through archives and diaries and letters, but also through landscape, because I think it's incredibly important to understand when you look at a, a, a historical figure and they've been a traveler, you need to see these landscapes. So I just wanted to show you a few steps of this journey. So I read his notes in the archives in Berlin. I don't know if you can see this. He has the worst handwriting on the planet. Um, I found his passport, his Spanish passport in the archives in Quito in Ecuador. So this is the passport that the Spanish king gave Humboldt to travel um, through the Spanish colonies. I read Charles Darwin's copies of Humboldt's books. Um, these books are amazingly still in the Cambridge, um, Ar Cambridge University archives. These two books actually went with Charles Darwin on the Beagle. And when you open them, you see that Darwin underlined so much of what, was, what Humboldt was writing. He wrote in the margin. So these books are really a, they are almost, you can listen to Charles Darwin having a dialogue with Humboldt because Humboldt was so influential on Charles Darwin. I went to Antisana, which is a volcano in Ecuador, and at um, 4,000 feet, we found this hut which is the hut in which Humboldt had spent the night before climbing Antisana. At that very moment, this herd of wild horses was kind of arriving, and I was standing in the middle of it, and four condors were circling above my head, so that was a pretty good day of research. I went to the Orinoco and the Maipures Rapids in Venezuela and in, um, in Colombia. I went to um, Colombia's um, mountains and rainforests. I went to Mexico City. But the most exciting moment for me was when I went to Chimborazo, the mountain, the, the volcano in Ecuador that was so elemental for Humboldt's uh, vision of nature. So let me tell you a little bit about his expedition. 
he and Bonplan, the French botanist Aimé Bonplan, went, left Europe in 1799 and they spent five years in Latin America. And I'm going to have to skip over some really exciting bits here, so you're going to have to read the book um, for that. But I wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor of what kind of man he was. Um, if I only had one word to describe him, it would be restless. He himself said that he felt as if he was chased by 10,000 pigs. And it was a restlessness that stayed with him um, all his life. He was not a cerebral scholar. He was brazenly adventurous, um, and he pushed his body to the limit um, again and again. He, for example, tested the sciences again and again on his own body. He drank, for example, the deadly curara poison that the indigenous people used in their blowguns. He rubbed chemicals and acids into uh, self-inflicted wounds on his body. He was the most experienced mountaineer of his age. He was a real adventurer. Um, take his journey along the Orinoco and the surrounding river networks. He, um, he and um, Bonplan paddled 1,400 miles along the rivers, 75 pretty grueling days deep in the rainforest where few white men had ever been. And it made for dangerous traveling. Their boat almost capsized. And as the water was coming in, and crocodiles and snakes were kind of swimming around them. Humboldt kept his calm and he grabbed his diary because that was the most important thing he had taken because it had all his scientific notes. And the amazing thing for an historian is when we look at this today, we can still see the watermarks in his diary. Um, these are the watermarks from the Orinoco. So this is really a moment when you're in the archives and you feel you are with him in the rainforest. They almost starved. Um, they suffered from high fevers. They encountered dangerous animals like jaguars and crocodiles and snakes and lots of mosquitoes. But they also encountered the most magnificent web of life on our planet, the rainforest, the greatest ecosystem, the richest ecosystem on Earth. And Humboldt was interested in everything. He tasted, for example, the water of the different rivers like a wine connoisseur and noted everything meticulously in his journals. He was, of course, fascinated by animals um, such as the red howler monkey or um, plants like the Brazil nut, which he subsequently um, introduced to Europe. He was obsessed with measurements. He carried 42 scientific instruments across Latin America during those five years. But he was not just interested in empirical data. He also said, nature must be experienced through feeling and imagination. And he said, imagination was like a balm of miraculous healing properties. So he was really driven also by this sense of wonder. And I think that's incredibly important. He's not just a scientist. He describes nature like a poet. He combines evocative landscape descriptions with hard scientific data, with scientific observations, and creates with this, I think, something like a blueprint of today's nature writing. He, he said something, which is my, actually my favorite quote. Um, he says, what speaks to the soul escapes our measurements. So for him, nature is not a kind of mechanical system. It's a living organism. It's a new world full of excitement that just waits to be discovered. He's not just fascinated by nature. He's also very much interested in the, in the indigenous people. And he, again and again in his diary, um, says that they are the best observers of nature, the best geographers he'd ever met. He collects their languages. He's fascinated by their worship of nature. From the Orinoco, they travel up north to Cuba, and then they go back to South America, to Cartagena, and then all the way down to Lima, um, across um, 4,000 kilometers across the Andes, some of the harshest landscape um, there is. Now, as they, climbed, as they crossed the Andes, he climbed every reachable volcano. And when you read his diaries, it almost seems like the more difficult it was, the more Humboldt seemed to have um, enjoyed himself. And I found this letter that he wrote from South America to a friend in Germany. It's a long letter in which he describes all kinds of dangers he's encountered, the crocodiles, the jaguars, the boat capsizing. And then he ends the letter with this sentence, and you, dearest, how is your monotonous life? 
So he's also very much a flawed personality, which I think is so important also to remember. He was relentlessly curious, and he saw connections everywhere. Um, he saw connections at a time, uh, he saw connections on a global scale, scale at a time when other scientists were much more looking at classification, at taxonomic units, as a kind of at a hierarchical order. He was looking um, globally. His brother Wilhelm said that Alexander's mind was made to connect ideas and to detect chains of things. And it was because of these connections that he realized that humankind was destroying nature. And he noticed this in, uh, in Lake Valencia, at Lake Valencia, which is in northern Venezuela, which was then a very wealthy agricultural region, lots of, region, lots of plantations. And he saw how plantation owners had destroyed the forests um, around the lake and how the rain had washed off all the good topsoil, how the water levels of the lake were falling because farmers had used the water uh, to irrigate their fields. Now, seeing this destruction, he was the first to explain the fundamental functions of the forest for the ecosystem, without using the word ecosystem because the term had not been coined yet. But he was talking about the tree's ability to store water, the tree's ability to enrich the atmosphere with moisture, and their protection against soil erosion, all things we know, of course, today. It was at Lake Valencia that Humboldt first predicted harmful human-induced climate change. Uh, he talked about mankind's mischief, which disturbs nature's order. It was at the Venezuelan coast that he also saw something else. He saw, for example, how ruthless pearl fishing had exhausted, completely destroyed, really, the oyster stock. So again and again, as he traveled through South America, he saw how humans were destroying nature because he saw these connections. At the high plateau of Mexico City, for example, he saw how the local irrigation system had left the valley below completely barren. And he's really not mincing his words. He says here, I think they're raping nature. So he's pretty clear about what he thinks. Uh, he talks about how mining um, exploited the land, but also the people. So again and again, he's mentioning this in his diaries. There are moments when he's so pessimistic that he talks about a future, a possible future. He writes this in his diary in 1801 when he's in Latin America. A possible future where humans might travel to distant planets. And he said, if that happens, we will take our lethal mixture of arrogance, violence and greed with us, and we will leave these planets as barren and as ravaged as we've already done with Earth. 1801, pretty prophetic. He returned to Europe in August 1804, so four five years later, and he has in his trunks, he has 60,000 um, plant specimens. Don't worry, I'm not going to show you 60,000, <laughs> just three. Uh, there today at the Berlin Botanical Garden, uh, 6,000 species, 2,000 were new to European botanists, which is a staggering number because um, at the end of the 18th century when he left, there were only 6,000 known species. But he also returned with thousands of pages from his diaries, hundreds of sketches, maps, drawings, and I just wanted to show you a few to just give you an idea how wide his interest is. So he does, again and again, he paints the profile of mountains. Um, he, he sketches monkeys, which then become engravings in his zoological um, uh, um, publications. This is a page from his um, diary from the Orinoco, so these are the different species of fish. Again and again, you have tables and tables and tables of all kinds of measurements he does. Um, he comes back with some of the best maps of South America. This is a, he, um, a map of the Rio Magdalena, for example, in today's Colombia. Again, you see um, profiles of volcanoes. This is one of my favorite. Uh, it's a tiny little sketch where he puts five mountains from across the world next to each other, and con he compares the height of the snow line um, according to the latitude where they are. So you have Chimborazo in the Andes, a mountain from the Himalaya, the, uh, from the Pyrenees uh, in Spain, from the Alps, and from Lapland. So he's kind of forever comparing. That's just what he does all the time. Another river map, this is the Valley of the Orinoco, for example. 
but then also the bone of a llama. Um, a beautiful sketch of an orchid. Uh, this is another um, page from his diary, which is a bird um, from the Orinoco. And here, a very faint pencil drawing of the Humboldt penguin, which he saw um, in Lima. This, I love this page. This is uh, from his diary, and he shows us the, the, the tents they're making every night. So these are, they take branches, and they kind of build these constructions. Then they take big heliconia leaves, and they cover them. Um, so, and he says these tents are so watertight that they never got wet. Inca ruins, uh, again and again he draws those. And then a beautiful um, s uh, map of South America. And here you see that he's also um, collecting words, um, languages uh, of the tribes um, they see along the Orinoco. And then um, hieroglyphs, Aztec hieroglyphs in Mexico City. So he's, he's fascinated by almost everything he sees. And what he comes back with is so rich and so much. Now, when he returns, he settles in Paris for 20 years, and then after that, he moves to Berlin until he dies. And in both cities, he um, establishes himself as the center of scientific inquiry. And he gives lectures and writes books. And I wanted to show a couple more um, manuscripts because I think you can learn a lot about a person when they um, when you look at their handwriting and at their, the, the way they saw, they write, basically. So these are his lecture notes. Um, he starts fairly conventional, I would say. Um, you know, writes down his thoughts, then he runs out of space, but then he doesn't take a new sheet of paper. He then begins to write everything in tiny bits of paper. And you can see that he kind of folds stuff out. He tears books, um, pages out of books. So you end up with this, this kind of collage of thoughts, which I promise you, this has no apparent order. I have no idea how he did his lectures with this. But it also shows that he doesn't just see nature as a web. It's also how his mind works. It doesn't just go in a linear way. When he returns, when he arrives in, 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 in Berlin, he kind of begins to write this book, which makes him really famous across the world, which was called Cosmos. The first volume was published in 1845, and it became a huge international bestseller. Now, this was a book that was very different to any other book before. He took his readers on an incredible journey from Earth to outer space, from the tiniest fleck of moss to the highest volcanoes, from poetry and landscape painting to the uh, migration of the human race. He covered everything. So at a time when other scientists were crawling into their ever-narrowing disciplines, Humboldt wrote a book that did exactly the opposite. It was a book that connected everything. And he talked about nature here as a wonderful web of organic life. And he described Earth as a natural whole animated and moved by inward forces. So he, so he really describes Earth as a living um, organism. For me, Humboldt is, um, Humboldt is really the bridge between the arts and the sciences, between the Enlightenment and the Romantics. So on the one side, you have scientists such as Isaac Newton, who explained that rainbows were created by, by light refracting through raindrops. And on the other hand, you have Romantic poets such as John Keats, who declared that Newton has destroyed all the poetry of the rainbow by reducing it to a prism. Now, Humboldt is, for me, the bridge in between. Um, we tend to draw a very sharp line between the arts and the sciences, between the objective and the subjective. But Humboldt's insight that we needed to use our imagination to understand nature, I think, is so relevant today. He talked about the deeply seated bond which unites the sciences, the arts, and poetry. And I think when I look at today's environmental debates, at least in the political arena, what I'm really missing there is the sense of awe for nature, this recognition that we are only going to protect what we love. So all of this is kind of based on often based on dry statistical projections, numbers, careful legal wording, which of course is all incredibly important, but what I'm missing is this passionate, dare I say, emotional advocacy for our planet. 
And I think there's a reason, and I'm showing the same picture <laughs> as you do, there's a reason why this extraordinary photograph of Earthrise has been hailed as the beginning of the environmental movement, because this was the very first time that we saw Earth in her wholeness, this tiny white and blue marble set against the vastness and blackness of space, utterly beautiful unimaginably fragile. And that was a realization that was carried by a sense of wonder, by a photograph that was taken in a scientific context. And I think it was the same sense of wonder that drove Humboldt. He said that nature was in a mysterious communication with our inner feelings. But at the same time, he also, 150 years ago, warned that the restless activity of large communities of men gradually despoil the face of the earth. So as scientists today are trying to understand and predict the global consequences of climate change, I think Humboldt's interdisciplinary methods, his idea of nature as a global force, are, remain very, very relevant. And to me, it feels like as if we've come full circle. And maybe now is the time to reclaim him as our hero. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. It, you must admit it was a riveting pr uh, presentation and uh, we are all seduced now. There is a protocol at the Arne Symposium which um, includes uh, the young researcher's vision, a uh, vision of the environmental crisis of the future of humanity and nature. And uh, in our case, the researchers are the winners of the Arne uh, stipend. Andrea, please come in. You should take your place at the table. Uh, and then we have Martin Nyborg and Margaret Volsturos. Uh, they are all young researchers, except for they are not young researchers. Today, they decided to be Lord Mayors of the three fictitious cities of the future. One of them is called Bethania. The other one is called uh, Genesia. And the third one is called uh, uh, Guest Nestland. Um, now, uh, I'd like to first of all address our um, uh, Lord Mayor of Benthamia. Uh, you've chosen Jeremy Bentham as your patron saint. Why have you done that? Hello. Uh, let me start off by correcting you. Uh, a city as secular as Benthamia has no need for anything as superstitious as a saint. Okay, I'm Catholic again. <laughs> Jeremy Bentham, the father of utilitarian philosophy, was chosen as our patron because he too was a progressive man who above all else uh, valued maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. With ecological collapse in the 2020s, the city was born out of necessity, which we all know is the mother of invention. Therefore, Benthamia is about invention. Today, we see our city as representing a new birth. It is a demonstration of secular and liberal values, human ingenuity, and technological prowess. Hearing of our ideas, bright minds from all over the world have come, all with a belief in the emancipatory potential of modern technology in an inhospitable world. The green-minded people view us as too detached from some romantic ideal of nature. The religious think that we have forgotten some god. We view ourselves as situated right where we ought to be, at the pinnacle of evolution. A new age called for new morals. Over the course of the last decades, we have struggled to overcome both our human condition and the epoch known as the Anthropocene. We strongly believe in improving human nature, that it is to be transcended, the future, then, should be superhuman. Technology has enabled us to genetically enhance people, both before birth and during life. Thus, we act preemptively. The enhanced individual requires less medicine and less therapeutic measures. It simply is better. For us, progress is only natural, 
and our economy centers on investing in endless innovation and in development. With advanced biotechnology, we have been able to increase the average lifespan of our citizens to 130 years old. That is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> we are one step, for every passing day, we are one step further from death and one step closer to Im immortality. Pregnancy, for example, now carries minimal risk and a child just stated outside its mother's womb and closed in a tank is not seen as less natural, not in any way. Enhancements in our ongoing education ensure that the minds of our elderly stay razor sharp. The steady flow on cr on, of climate refugees, on the other hand, help us ensure that our population growth is stable. True to the memory of our forefathers, a third industrial revolution is happening, as we have succeeded in fully mechanizing manual labor. This, in turn, enables us to apply the faculties of the mind to truly rational activities and to enjoy the pleasures of life. Science and technology give us new ways of seeing and being in the world. Psychosomatics and performance-enhancing drugs are readily available to every citizen over the age of 16, and they are popular. <laughs> We also invest heavily in virtual alternatives for exploring love and sexuality. While the simpler mor morals of the past were partial to the old ideas of monogamy and het heterogeneity, we are more open to new ways of feeling. Sex robots are now a natural part of people's lives, and we regard it as perfectly normal to have erotic feelings toward a synthetic other. This does not mean, however, that we see them as our equals. We are proud to have created them, but they are first and foremost here for our enjoyment. And more importantly, they are not self-conscious, at least not yet. For us, pleasure or well-being is a good in and of itself. Through pleasure, the superhuman flourishes. By dominating nature and the outer world, we have evolved to a point where technology now allows us to unburden ourselves. For us, it was but a small price to pay for super longevity super happiness and super intelligence. Enhancements, psychosomatics and assisting AI all help us to perceive in novel ways. For us, beauty lies in endless progress and in the growth of the city. In an age that calls for a reinvention of the very notions of nature and humanity, ladies and gentlemen, we are the avant-garde. Thank you. <laughs> Well, okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Superhuman. Uh, Welcome. <laughs> and, uh, let me turn to the Lord Mayor of Genesia. Does Genesia have anything to do with the Book of Genesis? Oh, yes, Nina, indeed. As you may recall, uh, the Honourless Chair, Mary Evelyn Tucker, when was that? Was it 2018, I think? 30 years has passed, but we will never forget her. And back then, she rem she told us how in every religion you find a creation story. As a radical environmentalist subgroup among Christians, Genesians believe that the Genesis is just that. And this is an idea that unifies all believers around the world, that there is a greater purpose and intention behind our creation. As it were, when global ecosystems finally collapsed in the 2020s, it was not just an ecological crisis, but a spiritual one. From the ashes of a failed modernity rose the God-abiding city of Genesia. We see it as our purpose to look backwards because we are proudly regressive, whereas my fellow mayors here believe there is a way forward once you've come to the end of a cliff. <laughs> this is nonsense. Society has progressed too much. Technology hurts humanity. And we must bring back the life we were intended for. So our ideology is one of religious libertinism, if you've heard of it. As Christian hedonists, we are inspired by Hindu teachings and have reinterpreted the entire Bible uh, out of constructivism. We see it as a product of its patriarchal society at the time, as much as anything. Bear with me for a second. You see, women has always been, uh, for centuries, inferior to men, seen so arbitrarily, obviously. But also, the physical has been seen as female. 
Femininity has, has been uh, associated with feelings, with taking care of something, with nature. Remember, Mother Earth, a typical terminology. Whilst masculinity and the male has been seen as metaphysical, more so, uh, such as men being the conveyors of reason, logic and theory. These are all obvious misconceptions, but this is also the reason why the physical have become the inferior to the metaphysical. And we have forgotten the physical body, our surroundings and nature altogether. This is what we have to bring back because it's what we were intended for. So God himself is a non-tangible spirit, granted. But he only came to life when he took the physical body of Jesus Christ. And remember, God needed Mary to come to life. So the physical is endlessly so, the anchor of the spiritual. And it is, it is our duty to the creator to take care of it, but our purpose to experience it. To that end, we have a trust economy, wanted to mention a bit on, on the dreary stuff as well. Money is metaphysical, is it not? What you can hold and touch is, is only a representation of what we uh, have uh, collectively agreed upon, its value. The buffer in our church state budget is a proud adaptability to fluctuating living standards, but uh, we, uh, we do finance absolute necessities by trading primary products. These sell as, as luxury items, obviously, because there is no finer and more trustworthy uh, produce on the uh, organic world market. We also have far lower health expenditures, and this is important because we ha have avoided all these severe mood disorders that these states, Neslan and Benthamia, uh, their state-subsidized loneliness have created. Um, we are not lonely in Indonesia. Instead, we have uh, entertained lifelong mentor-apprentice relationships, sister and brotherhoods which you choose, um, our excellent martial arts and physics teams, um, they have even proven to rehabilitate young criminals. And each teenager chooses their personal sexual mentor when they've come of age. It's absurd that you guys don't have that. <laughs> we also teach at our schools how to know ourselves. Because uh, ask yourself, why is it more important to know physics and geometry than to how to communicate your own feelings? This is what we believe in order to experience what it is to be human. As adults, we strive for what you call childish, which is only an unregulated state uh, um, where you don't allow the self-defeating adult mind to neglect the free, free flow of emotion, mostly. So let's be childish altogether. I believe Alan has said something of the same sort. <laughs> we also practice pain tolerance under the guidance of our professional sadomasochists. <laughs> we believe, we do, that controlled pain is a way, is a gateway to mental spaces of being, which we have yet to discover in our societies. Uh, if our kin die prematurely, we know that their spirits were ready for the eternal afterlife. In this sense, we accept our fate as earthly beings and suffering as part of life. If any, if any children are born with a uh, dysfunctionality, we see it as, or that soul's possession of that body, as its last little bit of experience needed. So they are half angels among us, nothing less. And we celebrate them for being just that, on the last stage to become an eternal spirit with God. Societies cannot substitute real experience with, well, with machines and screens, or freedom with authoritarianism, not to mention uh, good pain with way too much pleasure, without losing sight of that greater purpose. In Genesia, we aspire to be Holy Mary, to let our blood run freely in our rivers, feel the blood in our veins. Because that is God's creation and his divine plan for all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Many thanks for uh, your introduction to all the uh, pains and pleasures of the Ordonesia. And we are now finishing off with the four minutes on uh, the uh, 
pleasures and uh, duties of Nesland. Uh, here is the Lord Mayor, who is, as you know, dressed very soberly, unlike our Genesian uh, flamboyant creature. Uh, I'm very much ears, and uh, I'd like to know why, when I was reading the state report of, of, of uh, Nesland, mm -hmm. I had a sort of a vague feeling that it was going a bit in the authoritarian direction. <laughs> well, authoritarianism is a very loaded word, but yeah. Sure, in some cases, a guiding hand is necessary when we have walked too far off the path. And after all, Nestlein was established uh, after the international movement of hashtag green love in 2022, which you all know was a, the global community's reaction to the environmental destruction and superficial values at the beginning of the century. What was thought of as progress needed to be changed? It's like the environmental philosopher Holmes Rosen said, destroying species is like tearing pages out of an unread book written in a language that humans hardly know how to read about the place where they live. So in Nestlen, we believe that development must mean care for and cooperation with the whole natural system that we all depend on. A well-functioning society with healthy inhabitants needs flourishing natural systems, and this is green love. Therefore, in Nestlen, we value above all diversity in its utmost sense, ecological, biological, and of human personalities. We don't see humans as superior to other forms of life. Neither do we place the responsibility of our faith in the hands of some faceless God. Humans are sophisticated, intelligent beings. It is our responsibility to strive to be the most honorable version of what it means to be human. And after the IPCC report in 2018, it became very clear that sustainability was never going to be reached if we continue to naively trust in voluntary change in the free market and being scared of offending the privileged. Enforced regulations were an absolute necessity for societal changes. Only a strong state can guarantee to make the correct decisions on behalf of its citizens and the planets. Therefore, yes, Nestlé have had certain regulations from the beginning, such as a one car per household policy. We have a two children per couple policy. We have a, a complete ban on pesticides, strong regulations on the production of plastic, for example. And we have worked actively on the decommissioning of harmful industries to an environmentally and ethically motivated cost-benefit analysis. So through our system of ecological economics, we measure gross national happiness and green national product for a more wholesome definition of development. As opposed to the Benthamians who still believe in quantitative growth, or the Genesians who have abandoned progress altogether, green love means qualitative development. And yes, this means that today we have a smaller range of products and services compared to 30 years ago. But we don't see this as a decrease in life quality. On the contrary, overconsumption and materialism leads to destruction of nature, it leads to physical and psychological health issues, immense amounts of suffering and injustice. In Nestlé, we'd rather have a few pieces of excellent clothing instead of loads of garbage. We'd rather have healthy ecological food instead of heart disease. And the same goes for technology. Instead of blindly trusting that all new innovation produces something good, we critically evaluate which new technologies we want to adopt in our society. We fear that important aspects of being human may be lost if we uncritically trust technology as substitutes for experiences, such as virtual reality and sex bots, or the social media's effect on the young generation, which is why we have a 12 years age limit on smartphones. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, we see it as more evident than ever that physical interaction with nature is extremely important, both for our health and our, for our emotional and intellectual growth. In actually, um, middle school in Estland ends with a one year stay in the wild, with supervision, but still. <laughs> Our students are, after all, expected to excel in ecological wisdom and in morals and to find their individual potential and qualities. A school system that lays the groundwork for each person to become the best version of themselves is far more valuable for the collective society than monoculturing of people. So in this time of ecological collapse, we need to ask ourselves, what is wisdom? Societies that makes also people into products or which abandons thinking and sanity altogether, are in the end suicidal. Getting wiser, getting kinder, 
That is development. In Estland, in the name of Arnines, we think beautifully and we act beautifully. I am a, uh, a uh, intermission surrogate. Sum doesn't do intermissions, don't have time, too busy kind of saving the world. So as a non-intermission break, would everyone please stand up? Uh, good. Now wiggle any body part that you uh, care to wiggle. And I would also say you could uh, stretch your neck by looking up at the incredible ceiling that we have here. And everyone can clap. Here we go. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Okay, great. Everyone, please, please be seated. Is this on? Can you hear me? Now I can brag that I got a standing ovation. <sighs> My name is David Chocron. I am an informer. I inform about things. I love my job. I was just recently certified. I did the online course, took me only three years. If you already have a PhD, you can probably do it in two. I just mentioned that in case you're considering career options, which you might be doing after you hear my talk. Before I begin, I am required to ask you all this question. Are you all human beings? Are you sure? I mean, just think about it. Did you ever notice that either of your parents had a USB connector where their belly button should have been? No? Okay. Taking your word for it. Many of you are familiar with this book, Homo Deus, written by possibly the greatest visionary since Paul Ehrlich, Professor Yuval Harari. I am assuming that a symposium entitled Homo Futuris will be making some occasional references to the many concepts cataloged in Homo Deus. If not, it would almost be like the 1687 symposium on why things fall down, not mentioning the work of Sir Isaac Newton. Then again, we all know what happens when you sell too many books. Academia turns its back on you. You are irrelevant. Relevant, relevant, irrelevant. You don't matter anymore. Matter, matter, anti-matter. <laughs> Between you and me, that's why I often underreport my own book sales. Don't want Nina Witushek or uh, Andrea Wolf getting all envious on me. <laughs> Homo Deus was published in Hebrew in 2015. Now, Hebrew is a weird language. They read from right to left. There are no vowels, which is why the Hebrew edition is half an inch thinner than ours. You know, it's, it's actually a misconception that Jews are not allowed to utter the name of God. Not true. They just don't know how. He told them his name several years ago. They wrote it down without vowels. The millennia flew by, and suddenly they can't remember what he said. Was it Yahweh? Was it Yi Wu? Not easy to know. So they just, just stop saying it. Same thing with pork. It's not forbidden. They just didn't have any good recipes. So they took it off the menu. Anyway, Homo Deus published in 2015, three years ago. And three years is an eternity in this business, my friends. So here I am with the latest forecasts, fresh info. That's what I do. I'm an informer, but first, for those of you who didn't bother to read this non-peer-reviewed mega bestseller, some highlights. Okay, listen up. Free will is dead. End of discussion. 
Arna and Spinoza are probably up there saying, I told you so. Oh no, wait, the soul is also dead, as is the deity formerly known as God. We're still trying to find some, <laughs> we're still trying to find someone to go tell the Muslims. Okay, liberal humanism, individualism, democracy, gonzo. The Muslims already knew that. The new religion, Dadaism, is the only church in town. And we, the congregation, are nothing more than a confused collection of algorithms. A new superior species will evolve, the titular Homo Deus. And we sapiens are to be mercilessly extinctified at their leisure. All in all, a cozy little summer read. So, for the benefit of your further symposing, I bring you what's really gonna happen. Names, dates, places, let me emphasize, these are not predictions. These are facts with an accuracy of plus minus one hour. Only because we are still haven't figured out that deal with summertime, wintertime. Okay, so let's move on. 3 November 2020, 11.35 p.m., the current occupant of the White House is re-elected. <laughs> June to August 2022, global warming accelerates beyond all worst-case scenarios. Scenarios. U.S. citizens, mostly from southern, the southernmost states, red states, I might interject, mass emigrate to Canada. In response, Canadians build a southern wall <laughs> to keep out quote-unquote murderers, rapists, but mostly asshole Americans. <laughs> 2025, external devices like phones, tablets, and laptops are replaced with tiny data chips injected into the skull. Talking is out, telepathic texting is in, it's great at dinner parties. You can chew, drink, and converse simultaneously. <laughs> 2028, nanorobotics are successfully introduced into patients' bloodstreams. They find and fix an assortment of ailments. Third-party apps soon appear on the market, one of which allows you to inflate and deflate your lips remotely. Other inflatable body parts coming soon. I just read the stuff, I'm sorry. 2032, the, plo, pro, the proliferation of artificial intelligence and robotic workers send unemployment statistics to record highs. When violent protests break out worldwide, governments offer the jobless free HBO, and the crowds disperse. 2042, death is no longer mandatory. 2048, the first genetically engineered bionic babies are born. They are hyper-intelligent, super strong, and immune to illness. Most importantly, they don't cry unless you ask them to. And they are potty trained right out of the box, <laughs> so to speak. 2050, everybody wants a bionic baby, despite rumors that these mutant brats will bring on the demise of the human race. 2114, those bionic babies are officially classified a new species, and rather immodestly, they call themselves go man gods or homo deus. They find sapiens boring and useless and secretly debate their fate. Should they ship them all off to the zoo, a la the London Zoo, or to the power plant as a source of renewable energy, a la the Matrix, or to the slaughterhouse, a la Gilda. No matter where, it looks like it's game over for Team Sapiens. But wait, just in the nick of time, another previously undocumented self stealth species leaps onto the evolutionary stage. Who are they? Where are they from? Well, their ancestry hails from the last industrialized population to stubbornly cling to archaic traditions and skill sets. Deep into the 21st century, they could still gather berries, hunt deer, fish, fish. 
They could hike across entire mountains without helicopter support, build analog fires, and conceal themselves in small, primitive, offline dwellings known as hitters. <laughs> they could even endure an entire year at home with their own newborn offsprings while simultaneously embracing emerging, emerging technologies. They mutated. They evolved into something new and yet old. They are Homo Norvegicus, the stay behind species. <laughs> Applause. Don't have all day. It's showdown time on planet Earth. Homo Deus has the internet of all things. Homo Nor Norvegicus has deep ecology and Taco Friday. Who will prevail? Find out in my new non-peer-reviewed, non-fiction, hopefully mega bestseller, War of the Homos. This is more than a riveting page turner. It is a manifesto. It is a call to arms to all remaining able-bodied sapiens. And when the time comes, I know each and every one of you will do what's right. Because deterministically speaking, you have no choice. <laughs> I'm David Chokran. I'm an informer. Consider yourself informed. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> now we are going to the last chapter of our RNS symposium, which includes a panel of four uh, extraordinary gentlemen. Now we've had women, now it's gentlemen, you have to defend yourselves. Uh, the man behind the uh, RNS fanfare, the composer, uh, Lasse Thuresen, please uh, take your place at the table, at the debate table. Then uh, uh, we have uh, an unexpected guest, uh, Erling Kagge, who is the uh, explorer, publisher, writer. Please take your s uh, place at the table. We have uh, Kjetil Thuresen, uh, who is uh, not only the founding father of uh, Sneheta, a, a rather humble name for a, 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 an architecture bureau that is winning all international competitions, uh, but also a, a, an, an architect who is behind the fantastic, I think the one of the most beautiful, beautiful buildings in Oslo now screened by ugly skyscrapers, namely the Oslo Opera. Shatil, uh, uh, please. Uh, uh, We'll have you at the table. And Aina Schelle, Deputy General Secretary in the Norwegian Council of Ecumenical and International Relations. Uh, welcome, uh, Shetil. Einar. Shetil, Einar, Erling, and, uh, uh, and uh, Lasse. Uh, I think that I have the first uh, question to um, Lasse. Uh, you uh, are not only a composer and a thinker, but also a man of spirit. You define yourself as a, a follower of the Baha'i religion. And uh, it seems to me that uh, we have here a puzzle, which is interesting for all of us who are interested in religion, art, and uh, the way they combine. And it seems to me that um, there are two questions which have been plaguing me since I've been talking to you since I first met you, actually. Does classical music have any future in the world of digitalized and smart gadgets? So in other words, what's the future of classical music as you see it as a composer? And the second uh, question, uh, if practiced by everybody, would Baha'i religion uh, do more than, let's say, Christianity or Buddhism to uh, save us from the environmental disaster? So two questions. Yes, and I have five minutes. And you have four minutes. Four yeah. minutes, yes. Because I took one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, to start with the last question, uh, 
I would actually have liked to have that question in, uh, let's say, 100 years earlier. Oh, yeah, yeah, I understand. Because at yeah. that time, the answer would be very clear. Yes, yeah. uh, um, the Baha'i faith would be a great, uh, you know, have great benefits. You know, in 18th century, um, Baha'u'llah, who was a, a prophet of the Baha'i religion, and declared the equality of men and women, you know, individuals' freedom to search for truth, uh, uh, freeing himself from... from uh, arbitrary authority and seeing things with his own eyes and not with the eyes of others. He what about men and women? Both men and women, yes. And the, the equality of men and women were actually proclaimed then in, in Iran, of all places, uh, and confirmed by, by the prophet in 1848. Uh, so um, <laughs> he foresees that the main challenge of the future will be how to live with differences. In fact, he affirms that the whole creation is one, and that oneness, although that universal dimension of oneness is present in all religions, and it's a part of the Baha'i philosophy of religion that uh, the great religions are a revelation from the same source and actually contain some of the uh, very same eternal truths. The social laws that have been ordained in different religions are a part of a historic evolution that is bringing mankind to further levels of consciousness, mm -hmm. and they have to be discarded on the right time. You are not following God's will anymore by practicing, you know, the genocide that uh, Moses imposed on, on when, when he was uh, returning to the, you know, the Holy Land. So, so uh, there's, there are a number of progressive principles that are confirmed as being the will of God for our day, whereas Christianity uh, at that time, I speak 150 years ago, uh, resisted most of these. Now, uh, as time goes by, these principles have been absorbed by most thinking people, uh, also by uh, Christian churches, not all of them perhaps, and within churches, not all of the Christians, but uh, given a kind of um, power struggle within and interpretation work within the churches, these principles actually start to become universal. Mm -hmm. so, so, so in this sense, there, there, uh, there are uh, in a way no big uh, question about the values. One can col collaborate on most of these. Now, I would just add one thing, and that's to say religions can do things which politics cannot. Mm. And that is to provide a deep individual motivation for acting and for reforming one's own values, for dealing with one's own emotional reactions when they can be destructive. Uh, it induces a process of meditation and self-reflection, which, uh, without which uh, we cannot think of human progress. It cannot be just imposed by laws, by regulations, by technology. And that brings me a little bit to, to the question of, of music, because I think music and arts in the general, uh, op as opposed to science, has to do with changing our view on the world. Uh, I mean, science teaches us about the world, but the way to view, view that, the way to experience time, the way to experience phenomena with awe and wonder, that is actually what art can bring to us. And classical music, since you asked me specifically about that, well, it started in this age of enlightenment exactly in the spirit that we heard Humboldt has had, namely that of both using your rationality and using your heart, your sense of wonder, and combining these. Now, as enlightenment uh, tradition passed on in, in, in Europe, actually that sense of wonder, that sense of transcendence, which is there in the early enlightenment, has gone lost to the effect of only remaining the rationality, the intellectuality, the technicality, of the, of the world. So I think classical music has an important uh, role to do. However, it needs to be also readdressed. I mean, this is not a question of technology. It's not a question of style. It is a question of preserving that integration of the transcendent heart with, with rationality. And that can go, go on both, I mean, in, in, in any mm. uh, con technological co uh, context. That's not the, the question. Uh, classical music is in the process of being completely uh, left as a m thing of the museum, like a museum, you know. Of, of so you're not enterprise. optimistic about classical music? Uh, I'm, in, I'm a, I'm a long short-term pessimist and a long-time long term optimist, yes. Okay, very uh, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Well, anyhow, uh, thank you very much once again for your inspiration, both the Baha'i spiritual inspiration and the nature inspiration and your music, which is very listenable too still, which is uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, I think, a feat in the age of atonality. Uh, now, I have a question to uh, Einar. You said that uh, walking lightly on or treading lightly on earth is the key to the future. Uh, and um, uh, I wonder how is it possible in the age of religious wars and fundamentalisms clashing with one another, how are we supposed to do that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> difficult Sorry. question. I, I have uh, uh, reflected up upon this, um, and I'm not a prophet, as some of the other speakers here, but I, <laughs> um, yeah. I, I do believe in um, uh, that faith move mountains, mm -hmm. as it's also a headline here. Mary, um, w Mary will be very happy to hear. Yes, <laughs> and I, I think uh, religions is not dead. Um, as the last speaker said, Dadaism, I, I think uh, it's in part of, of uh, um, most human beings and societies in the earth, even if it's, it's uh, uh, taken other ways, it, has, um, um, it creates new faces, traces, hybrids, uh, for good and bad, I will say, for good and bad. Um, and when it comes to, uh, to care for creation, let me admit that part of our religious traditions, not least my own Protestant church, um, is, has been and maybe still is very anthropocentric. Um, especially the last generation have not been walking gently on the earth, mm. as, as we said. Uh, however, as, as uh, Professor Marilyn Evelyn Tucker has, has mentioned now in, in her introduction, we can see a growing green ecological awareness, also among religions, and in between religions, in the cooperation, uh, especially, I will say, uh, the last decades, but also uh, from the 80s and 90s, as, as you pointed out. And, and my church of Norway, for instance, has been influenced from, from contextual theolo theologies, con uh, holistic theologies from, from, from the south, the global south, from indigenous voices, not least our Sami, people, but also have this holistic approach. And not least, uh, what you mentioned also, Laudato Si, this uh, mm. encyclical, yes, mm. which is about connectedness um, in creation, um, which also um, challenge us to connect between religions uh, and between uh, different sex sectors, mm. um, business, science, and all people of goodwill. Yeah, I well think that is amazing. So business and science are involved as well. And you, yeah. as the deputy general of the Interfaith uh, Alliance, you yes, we, we are working a lot yeah? of that. And, and right. uh, yeah. I, I think we we can see that uh, uh, this has inspired also other uh, religion, as also Madeleine Tucker said. One example is, for instance, the Muslims. They came up with a with a declaration, uh, I think, directly inspired of Laudato Si, mm. which we now see is that in, in, in Morocco, for instance, uh, which I visited together with an imam from this city, <coughs> we saw 600 mosques being greened. Mm. And the year after, it's a, it's a process of greening 1,000 mosques in Indonesia. But being greened meaning what? It means that solar panel on the roof, All right. recycling, green education on Fridays, very oh. concrete things. Yeah. And the Hajj, this uh, famous uh, Islamic pilgrimage to Mecca, mm -hmm. is now in the, in the process of being greened. Um, that, that is a lot of amazing things going on in and between in the cooperation with religions. And one example is from, from here in Oslo, with, again with uh, Professor Merlin Tucker, was this Interfaith Rainforest Initiative that was launched here uh, with the Rainforest Foundation. Um, which is a multi-faith ally alliance, um, aims to bring moral urgency and spiritual resources to the global efforts to end tropical deforestation. Right, and yeah. again, that is in very strong cooperation between indigenous peoples, faith leaders, communities from below, and also in working with business and with governments. Yeah. And this is... Uh, a part of uh, what I say, uh, a global trend right now, which is walking 
together gently on earth. I see. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you very much for now. And uh, it sounds convincing. Maybe I'll invite more men to the ANNS Symposium after all. Uh, um, <laughs> Edding, I have a question to you. You've written uh, recently uh, an international bestseller. Uh, which is about silence uh, and how to live in silence or with silence in the age of smartphones. Now, is it possible at all uh, that silence is the future of humanity? I mean, how are we to bite it? Mm, I think, first of all, uh, the phones are called smartphones, but they are not that smart. They're not that smart. Okay, um, very good. I think it's a great name from a marketing point of view. Um, uh, just like they call the trains the iron horse, kind of adapt to people's, you know, images. But um, um, I think silence partly um, is a, it's a, it's not a great, you know, it's not a major answer, but it's a small and good answer. And uh, like Harari was mentioned here, and of course he's, 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 he's partly right, but I think, you know, he thinks, as people have been thinking for thousands of years, that these changes will happen so very fast, very quickly. Yeah, but Harari himself goes to be silent to an ashram every, every year, I hear. I, and I, that's I, where he gets all his brilliant uh, ideas. I, 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 I talk yeah. to him about that, and, but you know, still I think he's, you know, he's, he's, he thinks the, all these changes are happening too fast. Yeah. But anyway, um, I think you know, it's because I heard the name of Arne, I think you know it's it's in terms of silence. I think it's uh, Arne's ideas about uh, uh, generosity, generositas. I think that's you know very much kind of an answer because uh, to many of these uh, questions. And I also think it's interesting as Mary was quoting Einstein, but Arne was talking about the same about enlarging your friends, uh, the circle of your friends, like you're getting wider and wider, wider circles. Mm. And the probably both got it from Spinoza, who was an important philosopher for both of those guys. And um, I think in terms of silence, I think it's interesting. I had three teenage daughters, and a few years ago I understood that they didn't know what silence is. <laughs> uh, they're always connected, and I not th then I think about the opposite of silence is not sounds, but the opposite of silence is, uh, is uh, disturbances. They always disturb because they always have some expectations about something to happen, get a confirmation, uh, the sound of something, a text message, etc., etc. So they're always kind of always someone else not being themselves. And that's why I also sat down to write this book. Um, and I think, you know, somehow you have to create your own silence. You always have to, but it's in the future it's going to be even more important. And you also have to accept that your silence will be different from other people's silences. And I also think in terms of walking, I just wrote a book on walking. And I think that's, you know, that's very much opposite to what Harari is writing about, because Harari is all about high speed, uh, while walking is about the opposite. And of course, some years ago, generations ago, to uh, high speed was a privilege and slow speed was what everybody was you know, undertaking. And today it's the opposite, at least in other parts of the world. Uh, it's a privilege who can actually walk and move slowly ahead. Everybody is jogging, this is true. Yeah, jogging, but also the whole you know, basic of gross national product is that we all have to speed up at sure. all times. And, and having said that, also I read a piece by Mary uh, late last night. And I think she has a very good point in the sense that somehow we have to choose if we're going to be consumers, which is very much you know, in the interest of the government, or if we're going to be more participants and transformers. And also think if you live in a place like Norway, you have to try to make life more difficult than necessary. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this doesn't apply to people who, for instance, born in southern Sudan but I think it's important in other part of the world. And lastly, I was traveling with Arne to Micronesia once, and we went to this island called, um, um, I can't remember, strange name, it comes up. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, they built a city 1,500 years ago, out in the ocean, just like Venice, but just prior to Venice, and it's built of rocks, and up to 30 tons each. And the rocks came from the other side of the island, it's about 20 kilometers. And 
we asked the locals how could they transport the rocks 20 kilometers across the island, around the island, and then get into position to make the basics of, um, of Nalmadal, is named the island, basic of the city, and then they had wooden halves on the tops. And you can still see the, wood, no, the st stone structures. And we had an archaeologist, we asked him um, how it could be, and you know, the locals, they had this old myth that 1500 years ago, there was a huge explosion, all the rocks flew across the island <laughs> and landed, and the city was there. Yeah. And the archaeologist said, that's impossible, impossible, impossible. And then Arne was asked, and as Arne said, it's not impossible, but it's extremely unlikely. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Arno, as we know, was known for his precision and his obsession with precision. <coughs> uh, I'd like to uh, finish off uh, 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 short interventions on uh, silence, on music, on art, on religion, with the vision of an, one of the leading architects in the world, I suppose, uh, Shetil. Uh, you've been invited to talk about the future of the city. And the floor is yours. And as an architect, obviously, I need my crutches. Yes. Um, uh, Italo Calvino suggests that a city could be defined by the sum of events one will not be able to attend. It's defined by the generous uh, offerings uh, you could have enjoyed, but which you will only be a part of because you happen to live in the same city where they take place. But what happens when the digital platforms offer an increasing stream of events you still will not be able to attend? Well, you simply know of more things you cannot go to. And regardless of the number of offerings, you will still only be able to do one event at a time. So nothing really changed. And the fact that you knew about whatever was offered and thus became part of it also remains the same. But knowing about these events that you have not taken part of allows you to be part of the memory of that event because you can share it through films, books, newspapers, shows, uh, social networks, media, and not the least through shared personal experiences around dinner tables and in social settings. So, we could claim that a city that is full of options, exponentially increasing digitally, also will need more physical spaces that are increasingly important in relationship to your digital experience. Does reality need to be more real as the number of hours of virtual life increases? This leads me to my first wish for a future city. Never stop evolving this city, reinventing it, expanding or increasing what the city can offer to its citizens. The conglomerate of diversity can not only be measured in numbers, and a city can never be too much. So that leads me into an understanding of the average human being and how we spend our time. We spend 90% of our time in some sort of an enclosure. 90%. Approximately 15% in the toilet. Well, this also means that a vast majority of our decisions will be made in favor of other indoor activities because we make the choice indoor. And most of them will, at least very soon, be, be based on digital information you receive when located inside a room somewhere. The dilemma of physical location and digital information will expand all the way into virtual everyday experiences. So. Will our digital choices not be increasingly influenced by the contexts we are in? To help inhabitants of a city to become aware of their own presence in physical settings, alone or together, I believe it to be really useful to introduce prepositions as descriptions of body locations in a city. A place of the presence that cannot be hacked, but only nature really, captures all prepositions and body locations in relationship to where we are. Only nature can do that. 
Architecture and urban planning could learn from this and try to implement as many prepositions as possible. And these descriptive positions of our body help us to locate ourselves in the world. Prepositions such as under, between, over, on, at, after, before, by, with, without, from, towards, against, besides, next to, because of, on top, are all part of our own perception of our physical surroundings. Like on the Ofra roof, alone, together, looking in, skiing, or the restaurant under that actually is being perceived as architecture in itself, being part of the prepositions. Or nature-informed architecture at Dovre that actually holds you tight towards, are you inside the cave? Are you outside the cave? Are you in the mountains? Or are you on top of the mountain? Or Svart, a hotel which sits in the sea. It moves itself forwards simply by the way it reacts. Or is it the location of the bees in the beehives in the city? Enhancing experiences may also directly connect to how things uh, are in your surrounding and may be able to offer the things at the same time. These thoughts could lead to the understanding of the hybrid city. And these creations might actually lead to the expansion of critical thinking and reduce our habitual thinking. So the tacit urban sharing principle, the silent expression of common experiences, might lead to how we prioritize, how we make our choices. I will do this, not that. Now, all of a sudden, the context you are in will guide your choice. This, again, le leads us to the ever-present contradiction between the public and the private. Accessibility becomes a driver in itself, and the actual event, activity, meeting, or program awaiting you in the space you have accessed is fulfilled by you actually being there. You cannot perceive something that is not accessible, like us here in this room. So uh, Giambattista Nolli engraved maps of Rome in, uh, in 1748, differentiating only between public and private spaces. The dark spaces are private, open are white. No differentiation between indoor and outdoor. And I think if we look at this, the elements of Rome should have access to how we deal with public space today. We can do investigations that are experienced urban structures, potential urban structures, and cartographic structures. It could be the opening of Times Square and just letting the pedestrians come in it could be just opening up for a new position of your body in the city. Not everybody likes it, but some businessmen might like it, and some young girls might also like it. So the third wish is, can we create designs that clearly, clearly convey accessibility? All public functions, in my opinion, should be inviting and they should have no thresholds except the thresholds of experiential sequences. Maybe we could find urban ty typologies suiting our political and democratic system by increased focus. Now, this is from the fish market in Oman, and uh, actually giving a fish market to the fishermen of Oman actually helps running the public place that it is surrounded by. So the environment, obviously, I don't have to talk long, but the industry, the building industry, produces 40% of our polluting emissions. 40%. Our cities are growing worldwide, we know that. But the strange thing is that it's the 500,000 to a million inhabitant cities that grow the most. So our current situation that we have cannot be resolved in any way simply by building more and more. At least if you don't take precaution on how you build. We have to take care of our agriculture. We have to take care of the soil. There are hundreds and hundreds of years of embodied energies in soil. If we make large products like this project in France, why not put the full farm on top of this? You know, the little French farmhouse uh, up there to the right. Or 
the pollution of cities themselves become environmental, like here, Saint-Denis de Playel. So that leads me to my fi final point. Um, my grandfather explained to me how I have to move my head and my eyes when I'm out walking in nature. He said, I look ahead to see where you're going. Uh, look down so you don't stumble and fall. Look back to see where you came from. And then sometimes look up to the sky so you can dream. Hmm. I'm hoping and wishing for the future city that we will still be able to dream. And I'm hoping that we will be able to dream about beauty, environmental issues, social issues, and democratic development of certain accessibilities that need to be debated in the public and private domain. So I'm just showing you uh, one dreamy film of our new uh, Shanghai Opera House. Thank you.